Um, we're very pleased with the turnout. Tell your friends, buy the book on versobooks.com. Uh, to start the talk, I want to introduce um, the author of Confronting Capitalism, Vivek Chibber. He's a professor of sociology at NYU, and he's the editor of Catalyst magazine, which you can buy at the front desk. We also have joining us Anand Gopal, who is a writer at The New Yorker and a writer for Catalyst. So you can check out his work in that magazine as well. And he's going to start us off here. Thank you, Ariella, and congratulations for um, uttering a sentence that's never been uttered in the history of the working class, which is a writer for The New Yorker and Catalyst. <laughs> um, I want to start with a quote from Marx. Uh, Marx once said that a, outside of a dog, uh, a book is a man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's two Dr. Reed. That's Groucho, not Carl. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is actually an amazing book, and I've read a lot of books about capitalism and social theory in my day, and I have to say that I'm really sick and tired of all the jargon and the sort of the way in which we in the left talk about things, and what was so refreshing about this book was that it cuts through all of that. It's very clear, um, it's very concise, and it's something you can give to your mailman, it's something you can give to like ordinary people, um, and I feel embarrassed about it, so um, congratulations. To Vivek for that. Uh, Vivek, I wanted to start by asking you, because there's obviously lots of books about capitalism, uh, why did you decide to write this book now? Um, and what, basically, what was your motivation for this? Um, well, thanks, Anand and Ariella, uh, for coming down here and doing this. And thanks, obviously, to all of you. Uh, it's really nice to see such a big turnout. I, the book started out uh, as actually a series of pamphlets which I wrote for Jacobin. And the idea was exactly what the idea behind pamphlets usually is, which is you want to bring you know, somewhat complex ideas to an audience in a very simple and digestible form so that ordinary people who haven't had a college education, um, and certainly people who haven't had the, um, the, uh, the, bad, the horrible experience of grad school um, would be able to understand. And you know, there are a couple of motivations for that which was the first was that the, the moment I wrote these in 2018. 2018 was in the thick of the Bernie moment. And it was a time when you saw a younger generation of radicals and self-styled socialists coming up, coming through the ranks into politics. And uh, there was obviously a huge need for some kind of basic educational tools as to what socialism is and why it's important. Jacobin was already a fantastic success. And um, I thought using the Bhaskar Sankara's empire, uh, we could, uh, you know, as all empires, reach out into the, into the periphery and, and bring the natives in and try to give them the gifts of civilization. Uh, so the idea was that th there is a need for basic education on class, on socialism. Uh, but the second idea was what Anand just alluded to, which is, there was a time back when the left was mainstream and had real roots in society in this country, elsewhere, when communists made it their business to write popular educational books, not just on socialism, but you had books like you know, Mathematics for the Millions, Physics Made Easy, Biology for Everyone, that kind of thing. And what happened by the, the time of the 70s was the new left decided that the only way to convey ideas to somebody was in a package that nobody could possibly comprehend. So you had this incredible dearth of what I think ought to have been everywhere, which is basic educational material. And you would have thought it'd be all around because what did the new, le the new left was the first left that exited the working class and went into the universities. And you thought the one thing they would do is put out educational materials, but they did the, they did the exact opposite. Their, I think their professional aspirations and ambitions overtook whatever politics they might have had. So here comes this new generation of leftists, and there really is a huge dearth of material. What I saw when people asked me, give me something simple to read on trade unions, give me something simple to read on socialism, I found myself going back to things written in the 30s. Things that, say, William Foster wrote, or things that the Communist Party had written. It, that, it, that's a different world back then. And then when I saw the stuff that came out, there was a smattering of work from the 70s, 60s, and 70s. 
it was very sectarian. A lot of it was over, overtaken with debates and arguments between small groups with very narrow agendas behind it and quite, quite um, uh, aimed directly at a student audience rather than a general audience. So I thought, okay, what we need then is this, the, the, what commies used to do back in the day when there was still a communist party. And my, it, what I tried to do in these pamphlets was to write them. These are fairly orthodox Marxism, but written in a language that you would not otherwise recognize from the history of Marxism and without using any of the jargon of value theory and labor theory of value and all that kind of stuff. I wanted, without trying to prove that Marx was right about everything using Marx's language, I wanted to just to try to show that there's, there's a reason why this has been the most successful movement in the modern era, the working class movement. And that's because it has a theory that actually makes sense. And you shouldn't need to have to have a college degree to understand that theory. So that was the idea behind it. No, I, I want to ask oh, I'm you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I left it. The pamphlets then morphed into the book. That's the idea. And right. the reason that happened was I was worried that pamphlets disappear. And, uh, you know, I'm still reading pamphlets from the 30s. And I did have this hope that even if the pamphlets are gone, once it has an ISBN number and it's in libraries, maybe it'll be able to survive, you know, a little bit longer. So that was, that was the, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's right. I mean, this question of, of trying to orient towards a uh, student audience or now audience is very important. Let's table that for the moment. First, I want to ask you something which I like to ask everybody that I meet who's political. How did you get politicized? Yeah. Um, well, it, there's a sense in which I was born into it. Um, I was born and grew up in Delhi, India, moving to this country when I was 15. I considered myself a Marxist. I know I told somebody I'm a Marxist when I was 11. And the reason for that was um, every, my parents were Marxists. Everybody in our milieu was Marxist. And I'm, other than my extended family, I'm pretty sure I didn't know anyone who wasn't a Marxist until I was in my late teens among the adults from my family. Now, that's not decisive. All of my parents' friends were also socialists, but none of their kids turned out to be socialists. So there's something, some kind of personality involved, I guess, also. But that the, the, what I'm grateful for is that I was, I, was, I, was too, I was born too late to have participated in the movements of the 60s or earlier. But I was born at a time when I was still able to experience the the last embers of those movements and the cultures that they generated, the kind of people that they drew to them, which is very different from the people I saw in the 80s and 90s coming to the left in the US. I would have never become a leftist if that had been the culture I, would exposed, I was exposed to. But I, I saw extremely vibrant, emotionally healthy people uh, <laughs> who weren't content to be a weird little subculture coming to the left and um, it, it was something that gave them life and energy. So when I was young, I was like, I want to be like those people. And so it, I came to Marxism before I really knew what it meant. I was more a socialist than a Marxist. That carried over into my teens when I came to the US and into college. And um, it, it, like all Indians, I was genetically modified to be a doctor. Uh, so I entered college thinking I was going to be a doctor, but I, I, I soon left that when mainly as a reaction to the kind of people who I met in pre-med. And so then I said, well, where else, what else am I going to do? I'm going to study to be a Marxist. The difficulty was there was no one to study with. I was at Northwestern at the time. So I just holed up in the library for three years and didn't really come out except to eat. And um, grad school helped. I was very lucky to study with somebody who was exceedingly supportive in Eric Olin Wright. Um, and then I spent a few years in one of the last of the post-Trotskyist organizations called Solidarity. And I, I learned a lot from that as well. So I was able to get a confluence of the, the remnants of the Indian left when it was at its revolutionary best in some ways in the 70s. And then you know, some of the better um, elements, I think, of the aging and quickly, rapidly disintegrating new left in the United States. And luckily, I'm stubborn enough. And I was able to get enough support that I was able to, to keep with it into, into middle age. So this world that you came up in when you were 11 in the Indian left and the kind of Marxism that you imbibed at that time, or the socialism you imbibed at that time. I'm kind of, I'm curious, how does that compare to the left today here in the United States? What are the similarities? What are the differences? What have they done better? What have they done? What, what do we do better, if anything? I mean, 
it was very different from the current American. Um, now, the current American left is different from the American left of 15 years ago. So we have to periodize this carefully. Let's just for a second compare it to the, the left of the neoliberal era, the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. It was different in a couple of ways. One was that um, the left that I was exposed to was a very activist left. So it was, and, but they were all academics and very, very different from the academics who was, I saw coming to the left, the far left in the 90s and 2000s, which is the left in India was under-intellectualized but beautifully socialized. They weren't into big, deep, esoteric debates, but they, they debated all the time. They weren't into impenetrable prose, but, and they tried to make their ideas clear. What they were deeply committed to was a, a humble and nonstop commitment to social struggle without looking to be the plenary speaker at this conference or that conference, without looking to have their 15 seconds of fame by tweeting out. It was never about them. And like the left here, they were all middle class, but they were deeply embarrassed about drawing attention to themselves. I'm oppressed this way, I'm marginalized that way, you silenced me here, my agency there. The idea was, we are all doing really well. And sure, as this caste or that gender or this sexuality, we face certain liabilities, but it doesn't even begin to compare with the lives of 80% of the Indian population. So you come together in those struggles, and then you fight out amongst yourselves for whatever hierarchies and problems there are in the organizations, and there are plenty. But you understand the difference between what you're facing and what it means to be a peasant or a worker in India. Without knowing it, I internalized that a lot. The basic rule of thumb was, don't talk about yourself. It's gross. Try to talk about the world. So, but it was intellectually alive enough that I was always, what, part of what it drew to me was the endless debates in my home between 15 or 16 people, five of whom would be underground on the lamb from the cops, smoke-filled rooms, and totally egalitarian atmosphere in which somebody's cooking, somebody's doing the cleaning, nobody knows who, nobody knows who it is. It was great. Um, the, the difference with the American left, when I came here, the American left was much more serious about theory, about getting the theory right, about understanding things, ordering it right. Um, but it was totally isolated from social struggles. And as a result, by the 2000s, definitely, it was over-intellectualized and under-socialized. Endless debates that were pointless shit. And mostly people who you would never want to spend more than 10 minutes with. So it was a curious, uh, I'm, and I'm glad I wasn't a, confined to just one of these two influences because each had its severe drawbacks. My experience in the post Trotsky's left allowed me to take theory more seriously and understand how to carry out those debates. But my bringing up in India imbibed in me a sense that all of us on the American left, by and large, are doing really well for ourselves. And it's kind of grotesque to constantly call attention to yourself, which is what most of us used to do. I want to get into the book a little bit. Um, there's a lot here in just, I don't know, 150 pages. But let's talk a little bit about, so obviously, confronting capitalism, a lot of this is about class, right? Um, and if you look at the world today, there's a lot of injustices. There's a lot of terrible shit that's happening. There are people who are living on the street. There are people who are suffering from addiction. There's all sorts of ways in which we can conceptualize how to organize those who are suffering from injustice. Now, being a member of the working class is just one of those ways, but the, most of this book is focused on that. So why this centrality of class? Why are you putting class um, at the front? Um, if you could talk about that. The basic idea, of what, and what's been at the heart of socialism from the start, has been that there, there are myriad injustices in modern society. Um, the essential precondition precondition to solving any of them, any of them, is to endow people with the economic resources so that they do not become dependent on others and so that they might be able to have the wherewithal to pursue whatever notion of the good life that they are inspired by, whether it's to be an artist, whether it's to be uh, a uh, novelist, whether it's to be a, a, a frontline worker or, or anything like that, which includes their ability to express and act upon their chosen sexuality or their chosen gender or something in a 
society that's fully commodified constantly having to be insecure and not having the basic means of subsistence means you are forced to prioritize that above all else, which means not only do you suffer the injustice of economic insecurity, you are the, your circumstances force you to prioritize securing your economic reproduction above so many of the other things that you value. That, that's the basic thing, the basic idea behind it. So that without economic justice, the constraints on the other dimension of justice become overpowering. Now, the question then becomes, how is economic injustice endemic to or central or essential to modern society? And that's where Marx's great insight came in, which is that the society is driven by a ceaseless pursuit of profit. And that pursuit of profit is put ahead of and before the welfare of the people who produce that profit, which is the vast majority of society. As long as you're subject to this relentless, ceaseless prioritization of profit, other pursuits for anybody become secondary. Well, how do you solve that? There were two ways of solving it. In the 19th century, much of the the uh, the desire, the attempts to civilize capitalism were through do-gooding or through moralistic individual uh, uh, appealing to individuals to behave better, to do things differently. This is what Engels brought up in this beautiful book, so Socialism, Scientific, and Utopian. He said, people behave the way they do because they have to. So enjoining them to behave better doesn't do anything. Figure out why they behave the way they do. And the idea was, the people who were relentlessly pursuing profit and forcing everyone else to live their lives along the lines dictated by that, those people are capitalists. And they do what they do, not because they're evil, not because they're greedy, but because their position in the market economy forces them to do so, because that's the only way they survive as capitalists, by driving down wages, by making people work longer hours, by destroying the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea was, if you want to increase the scope for justice, you have to decrease the power of capital. Well, the only way you're going to do that is not by enjoining them, begging them to be better people, but by exercising a countervailing power over them. And the only countervailing power there is in capitalist society is the power of the people who work for them. That's class. That's the working class. So this is an important point, which is that Class politics becomes not only essential to the pursuit of economic justice, but the, the pursuit of economic justice becomes a precondition for other dimensions of justice as well, gender, race, sexuality. So that means then that there is a, the, the prioritization of class isn't some fixation, it's not some arbitrary choice that socialists have made. It is the axis along which what Martin Luther King said, the arc of justice is going to unfold, as it were. So then you the point of the book is to show why capital does what it does, why it's a structural pressure on capitalists. They are also bound by capitalism, just as workers are. And in order to widen the space for better lives for the majority, you have to narrow the scope of the profit motive in society. Perhaps that can then get to the point where you can eliminate it altogether. And that's what I address in the, the fourth chapter. But without the power of working people, everything else collapses. And that was the point of the book. Um, it's really clear in the book the way that you parse out why capitalism has the dynamics that it has. It's not about greed. It's not about personal feelings. It's not about animus. You say repeatedly, it's the rules of the game. And competition is what drives it. Competition between firms, competition between workers constantly driving down the value of labor to drive up profits. I think it's important because people always look for a theory of why they're experiencing what they're experiencing. It's a natural thing to do. And one thing that's sort of come out of this void of clear and accessible explanations of capitalism is like capital C capitalism that has agency and wants you to suffer and like hates your family and hates your self-care routine. And it creates this idea that um, is endemic to any neoliberal explanation of anything, that it's deeply rooted in the personal feelings of the actors and the system is an expression of those feelings. What the book does is so clearly talks about why no matter what people felt in the game, 
you'd always end up with the same outcome. And I especially appreciate that in the structure, but also when you're talking about capitalism in the state. And I was wondering if you could sort of dig into the relationship between the state and capitalism. Yeah, and this is one of those areas in which the new left made some uh, really good advances theoretically because Lenin bequeathed the completely shit theory of the state. Um, it, it's one in, in which you really don't understand why the state does what it does, and there's a reason for that. Marx also didn't give us very much on the state, and it's because in the time that they were living, remember that capitalism didn't uh, become a democratic capitalism until the second decade of the 20th century. So in the 19th century and the early 20th century, if you wanted to know why does a state always take the side of employers, it was because they were the only people in charge of it. They were the only people who could vote. They were the only people who had any entree into the political system. So you don't have to be a genius to ask, why is the state a class state? And so it's very, very underdeveloped, uh, the, the classical theory of the state. It was in the 70s and 80s that the next, that generation of Marxists had to contend with the fact that, look, workers have the power to vote. There's a democracy. So how come when they've got all the numbers, how come you still get outcomes which are basically favorable to capital? Now, the, the traditional explanation on the post second international, third international left, focused a lot on what we would call institution capture, state capture by rich people. It, rich people have the means, the wherewithal. Uh, in the United States, elections are funded privately, so you got to go to the rich people to get money to vote, to, to run for office. So it seems like the Marxist theory of the state ought to be, well, the state is captured by the wealthy in the 19th century, because they were the only ones who could vote, and in the 20th century, because they've got all the money, and elections still run on money. But there's a deeper dimension to it, which is what I try to bring out in the book, which builds on the work that came out in the 70s and 80s. This deeper dimension is that there's a structural connection that is a much deeper than, connection than you would expect by the institutional facts about how elections are organized, or how money is organized, things like that. There's a deep structural fact, which is that the state depends on the activities of private investors if it's going to be a viable institutional structure. It depends on the, the willingness of private investors to support whoever's in government. Now, how's that? There's two mechanisms for that, which were not theorized by the first two generations of Marxists. The first mechanism is that whoever's in power, whatever party they belong to, whatever political ideology they have, in order to fund whatever programs they are favorable towards, whether it's building up the military or building up childcare or building up healthcare, in order to have the revenues to fund those programs, they depend on the resources, tax revenues, the uh, budgetary resources that come out of economic activity. And all economic activity is dependent on private investment. If private investors slow down their rate of investment, or if they take their money, there's capital flight, or if they just put it in the bank, there, it starts off a, a process in which the economic slowdowns end up generating huge deficits, which means governments have to put all their attention into making investors happy again, so they'll reinitiate re the process of investment. That means the state has to prioritize the whims, the preferences, capitalists, whether or not it's a left-wing state or a right-wing state. What a left-wing state or right-wing state determines is how subservient they are to that imperative, not if they are subservient. The second channel is a political one, which is demo governments in a democratic capitalism depend on large numbers of people voting for them, most of whom are working people. And again, if your policies piss off investors, even if those investors have not captured the state, even if they don't fund your political campaigns, even if they are not themselves funding your, uh, running your apparatuses, if they piss off the investors and the economy slows down, you're throwing millions of people out of work and people who lose their jobs vote the government out of office. So the government now has to worry again for political reasons as an independent channel, keeping investors happy. This means regardless of country, regardless of party, regardless of politicians, regardless of ideology, there is a deep abiding powerful structural pressure on the state to make sure investors are ha happy as their first order of business before they do anything else. Now, what 
the book then takes up is, well, how can you have any reforms at all in a situation like that? And again, it comes through class and class struggle, which I try to explain in the book. But the main point here is that the class character of the state is built into its dependence on capital as a fundamental, ineradicable fact about the system. If you're in capitalism, if it's a capitalist economy, the state is going to have to prioritize capital. This is something that the earlier generations of Marxists did not fully flesh out, but that's what makes it a science. It's not a doctrine. You can develop the theory even when the originators are dead. The other thing that you touch on, which Anand uh, discussed earlier, is the idea that having a class-based analysis may be criticized as ignoring other types of oppression, other dimensions of oppression that are also violent and brutal and horrific. Um, you know, some people call this class reductionism, other people call the other side race reductionism, but I think you have an elegant solution um, <laughs> that's simple enough that it should be uncontroversial, and that is solidarity. Yeah, so uh, I, I would, I would put more flesh on that, because you're absolutely right, Ariel. I, I would say this, that one of the great victories of the, the elite, the, the victories of the kind of the professional classes and the wealthier classes and their capture of political discourse, one of the great victories has been to say that if you are taking up matters of class, you are ignoring issues of racial justice or gender justice. Now, this would have been news to the last hundred years of socialists who were brown or black and who were not male, who always thought that the road to gender or racial justice is through class struggle, not by ignoring it. Now, how, how would they, either they were complete idiots or they were something to what they were saying. And to my mind, the reason they said that is this, that it's very hard for minorities or women to rest free of the forms of domination to which they're subjected if they are economically dependent on the people who are dominating them. The way out is by providing them with the economic resources and the economic independence so that if they are being repressed in some way or, or dominated, if they're being treated badly, they, they have exit options for themselves or they have the resources to fight back. You can't, if you're a working class black person and you're living in terrible housing and you don't get a decent education because your neighborhood schools are falling apart, you can't go to college because you don't have the money to do so, you're going to get the jobs that are available and those jobs are usually going to be the worst jobs. And because they're the worst jobs, you're going to have the worst outcomes. Martin Luther King understood this, Baird Rustin understood it, A. Philip Randolph understands it, but somehow they were the idiots who kept talking about poor people's campaigns and having some kind of freedom budget, which focused on economics, it's, to me, it's inconceivable that the people who achieved the most towards racial justice somehow didn't understand that if they're pursuing economic motives, they are missing the essence of race. The point here is the, the problem with what we call identity politics is not that it prioritizes race over class or gender over class but that it cannot resolve the problem of race domination or gender domination because it represents the interests of the well-off communities within women or blacks or Latinos or whichever race you're talking about. It's like every other collective identity, like nationalism or anything like that. There's no such thing as nationalism in the abstract. There's a nationalism of elites and the wealthy, and there's a nationalism of working people. And it's the same thing with identity politics. There's the, there's the politics of race that represents the interests of working class minorities. And there's the politics of gender, which represents the interests of working class women. And what the elite versions of these things cannot achieve is emancipation for the poor working class section. This is what socialists understood for a century and what the contemporary left is exceedingly nervous and unsure about. And until they get this straight, identity politics will continue to be used as a cudgel against all attempts not of white workers, but of black workers to advance their interests. And that's just where we are now. Yeah, Vivek, I think a good example of this, maybe you can talk about it. If you compare the program, such as it was, of Black Lives Matter with um, the Black Power program, 
Um, and, and there's actually, you know, you can find it written on, on the page, people having making demands. So can you c compare these two? And what, the, what does that tell us about the orientation uh, of activists towards uh, issues of class and race? When, when Alicia Garza first put up the program and the, 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 the demands of Black Lives Matter, I, I haven't been able to find it, and I wish I'd done a, taken a, a uh, print screen so a snapshot. What's it called? It might be in the Screenshot. internet archive. Screenshot. Screenshot. Sorry. Yeah, it, it got uh, deleted. Yeah. It might be yeah. in the internet archive. I've I know. Been if to find somebody it can too. find it, please send it to me. <laughs> I, I. So this, she said, here's what we stand for. So it was called a herstory of Black Lives Matter. And um, I think the first nine demands all had to do with sexuality, representation, diversity, and these things. The first economic demand was like the eleventh or twelfth one. If you go back and look at the Black Panthers initial program, I think four out of the first five demands were economic. That essentially captures the difference. I don't know if that's what you were. That, that's to. what I was asking. Yeah. That captures the difference between and that's and the Black Power movement itself had a lot of political ambiguities and problems within it. Um, the, the emblem for me is really is Baird Rustin's Freedom Budget. If you, the Freedom Budget, it was the most profound anti-racist program that post-war America had seen. And as, unfortunately, he released it at a time when it had no chance of succeeding and it got buried. Um, but if you, if you compare those two documents, the Black Panther's initial program, the Freedom Budget, with today's avatars of those things, there's just no comparison. It shows the institutional and class background of what this movement was today. And you know, I'm sorry, I, I hope I don't offend anyone, but the last year has Adolf Reed said it best. He said, there was nothing to co-opt in BLM. <laughs> you know, uh, Patrice Colors has her $5 million mansion, and she's hired her brother-in-law for security and given away money to her cousin, whatever. If you, if, you, if you knew the, if you saw the, if you could read the tea leaves when they put out their documents, you saw this coming. Yeah, let's get, let's get into that a little bit. Um, you know, for, for a good portion of the 20th century, if you were politicized, if you came across political ideas or radical ideas, odds are that you did so, especially if you're in Europe, um, but also here to some extent in the United States, you did so because you are part of a political party or you're or in the workplace, you're part of a union. Um, and then we think of political parties in this country as a, a party that you vote for, or the candidates you vote for every two or four years. But you know, actually historically, especially in social democracies, political parties are much more all-encompassing. Um, you know, it was a place where you could meet your spouse or you send your kids to socialist I summer did. school. You met your <laughs> at a political party. Um, well, there you go. Uh, so did I. <laughs> I did not. Well, that's worth. But um, so. <laughs> You know, you know, so when you're coming, when you're getting politicized, you're getting politicized through political organizations or unions or at the workplace. Today, and for some years now, most people, when they get politicized, it's at the college campus. Right? So what are the consequences of that shift? It's a pretty profound shift, I think, and it's been going on for decades. Uh, what does that mean for politics, and how does that relate to what you were saying before about the changing nature of the program, let's say, of Black Lives Matter versus uh, the 60s movements? I mean, it's not just Black Lives Matter. It, it's the American left, generally speaking. And w one of the, when in, in the early 2000s, when I was teaching Marxism, and even into the, the 2010s, when um, we were hope, you know, I had noticed that by, by 2010, it had been 50 years since there had been a major anti-capitalist upsurge in the US. And that's the longest the US had gone since the revolution. Even in Europe, the, every 25 to 30 years, if you look at European history from the French Revolution onwards, there have been a major anti-ruling class mobilization. And something happened after 68, where you went five decades without one. And in those five decades, you also had the tearing apart of every social institution that capitalism had built up, that the labor movement had built up within capitalism over the last 150 years. So that by the 2010s, Bourgeois society was a Hobbesian world. It's a war of all against all, every person for themselves. And every political discourse became centered around the individual, including the left, all this shit about me, myself. You know. So um, one knew, and then you had all these theories, post-structuralist this, post-colonial bad, post-modern this, none of it made any sense. So 
you knew that when the left gets going again, the first fight would be over what it means to be on the left because it had been so degraded and turned into a vehicle of advancement for professionals rather than a theory to actually understand capitalism. I knew that, and I kept saying it to my students, and I still had no idea how bad it was until the Bernie moment. And you saw in response to Bernie when the American left was presented with a political program that was extraordinary, how much of it, when presented with that program, lost their shit. Because now you, were, you had no excuse. There's, here's the line, either you, you know, Hick wrote us either you cross the line and come over to the first genuine mass mobilization, and it wasn't anti-capitalist, but it was anti-neoliberalism, first one we've seen in close to 50 years, or you come up with all the shortcomings. He doesn't understand this, he doesn't understand that, right? Um, one knew all this. Why does it happen? Well, it's what Anand says. It's not just that the left retreated to the academy. You know, there was a vibrant, vibrant student left movement in India right up until about eight or 10 years ago. It was all on universities. It's true also, even in Chile until recently, there was a revival of the student movement and they didn't look anything like the American student left. They talked about other people, not about themselves. They talked about the poor, not about the tribulations of you know, rich professors about when they get tenured, how many, whether or not they get cited. Um, the difference is that student left on campuses was operating in a culture where there was still a viable political left culture outside the campus. Even the SDS, right, in the 60s. If you look at Kirkpatrick's sales book on the SDS and you read their earlier documents, there is an attempt to understand capitalism. You know, we, the system has a name, let's name it, all that shit. It's because there was a left outside of campus. And what happens in the interim is not only does the, the progressives and left people retreat into the universities in the 80s and 90s, but they do it at a time when every single labor working class institution, an institution of commonality and a common culture is being torn apart. You combine those two things and it's, again, it should not be a surprise that we are as badly off as we are by historical standards. So there's never been a time, to my knowledge, when there's a left resurgence and the first fight is over what the hell does it even mean to be a leftist. Everybody understood from 1830, which is what I think when the modern left is born, all the way into to 1970, et cetera. If you're on the left, you are anti-capitalist before anything else. If you're not anti-capitalist, you're something else. Fine, go do your thing. But it's neither radical nor left-wing. Today, you bring up capitalist, capitalism and you are, what are you, class reductionist, economic, blah, 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 blah. How pathetic. That is a left that's going to go absolutely nowhere. The good thing is, I said earlier, there is a, a ellipse within the periodization, which is from 2011 or 12 onwards, this left has, I think, undergone an extraordinary period of maturation where I see people today in their mid, late 20s, early 30s who have a maturity that blows my mind, political maturity. I don't know where it comes from. And that is the generation that these, this book was written for because they, they see the absurdity of what's called radicalism in American culture. It's narcissism, it's inward orientation, it's hatred of the poor. And they're trying to find their way out of it but they're trying to find their way out of it in an intellectual culture that's, and in a capitalist structure that's so different from the 30s or even the 60s. We have to now initiate a new project of research, of scientific inquiry, philosophical inquiry, to see how in this capitalism, the goals and the ambitions of the classical left can be reignited and be made effective again. If it does not happen that we rediscover the the energy and the commitment and the effectivity of labor and working people, we will not get out of this morass. Vivek, I want to ask you about what I think is the best chapter of the book. And if you read nothing else in the book, you should read the last chapter. It's, it's, it's also the shortest. It is short. That's why I like <laughs> it so much. Um, OK, so in the last chapter, you discuss the, Rus the Russian Revolution, right? Because uh, you, you say essentially that we in the left, we need a North Star, we need some kind of guide. Um, the chapter is called Beyond Capitalism. 
Right. So in the Russian Revolution, you argued that there's two lessons that we should take away from the Russian Revolution. One is organizational, one is institutional. I want to ask you first about organizational. What do you think are the or is the organizational lesson that the Russian Revolution teaches us? I mean, this is the issue on which I think we have to be the most open. And I advance my argument as a series of tentative proposals and propositions, not as, a, uh, as assertions. Um, the problem, that the, the organizational dilemma that the Bolshevik Revolution left us, and, and through that revolution, the, the various generations of communist parties across the world, all of whom shared this model, the dilemma is the following, that it's, it's perfectly clear that the decline and degeneration of the Soviet model and Bolshevism cannot be separated from the internal structure of their parties that they built up and that they left behind for us because they were those parties ended up being extremely undemocratic. And when married to the, the, the dynamics of a centralized planned economy, they created a new class of overlords. Whether you want to call it a state capitalism or deformed bureaucratic state, uh, it doesn't matter. The bureaucratic fact is, collectivism. <laughs> bureaucratic collectivism. It, it, it is a, it was a some kind of new elite, whatever, however you might label that elite. And it, it has, it is absolutely connected to the lack of channels of dissent and debate within the party and democratic accountability within the party. That's clear. So we have to be aware of those limitations and seek an organizational vehicle for ourselves that avoids the fate of those parties. At the same time, there is the fact that those are the only parties who've ever achieved anything. The new left's experiments in horizontalism, in friarian pedagogy, in prefigurative politics, the post-90s thing of horizontalism, of decentralized, this, that, and the other, they had their place, they achieved, they kept people's energies up, but they, they, they were organizational innovations of an era of defeat. Maybe they can achieve something in a different era. I don't see how, because I see their weaknesses as being endemic. Why? Well, the re there's a reason why I think the classical, call them communist organizations, were effective, which is that they had to have an internal structure and a solidity and some kind of um, organizational uh, consistency because they were taking on an exceedingly powerful foe. These new experimental designs of horizontalism and all this and the other, they're fine as long as you're not actually fighting anyone. But once you take on this, an actual state and actual employers and all that, it's very hard to do it without real internal discipline, some kind of hierarchy internally. Um, that being the case, it's just not clear to me how, how to merge these two things and what I, what, how to marry these two concerns. And what I said in the book is that here's what I think we absolutely will need. You're going to have to have what I call a cadre-based organization. If you're going to recruit workers into an organization, you can't just say, here's a link to our party, click if you want to be a member. You need to have an ideological consistency within the party. And I, I think you can only do that if there's some filter for who you allow in and who you don't. And then when you're reaching out, if you're organizing in neighborhoods, if you're organizing in workplaces, the people who you send out to organize, we call them cadre. And they're going to have to be trained the way union organizers are trained. They're going to have to have an ideological viewpoint, which they share with each other, but there's a consistent message that's being given out to the people you're organizing. That's cadre. Now, if you're going to have a cadre, you're going to have to have some degree of centralization. No, no way around that. that you, you can't tell cadre, hey, man, just do your thing, whatever it is. They have to be accountable to the party. So I think you have to have cadre. Um, and I think there has to be some kind of central strategic vision so that if you are a large national organization, there, you, there's some degree of common project, even though you allow local initiatives and local, some kind of spontaneous energies, there has to be an accountability to a central strategic vision. I think that's consistent with many different kinds of innovations and broad organizational structures, but it does limit the range. So if we can find some way to take on capital and take on the state, because if you're not a fighting organization, forget it. If we can be a, build a fighting organization without these two things, I'd like to see it. I don't know of any historical examples where you've 
been able to do that, including social democratic parties. The institutional one is, is a separate matter. Before I get to the institutional one, really quickly, um, so the challenge, what you're describing essentially, pardon my French, is Leninism. Right. The, uh, when I said the Bolshevik model was Leninism. Yeah, so, so I mean, the challenge is the, the, the Bolshevik party, historically, before 1917, was extraordinarily democratic. It had a wide range of uh, debate, internal debate. Um, they would hold leaders to account. Uh, since 1917, that model has essentially failed to be reproduced, right? So, I mean, why is that? Is it because just of the particular moral dispositions and political dispositions right. of the leaders? Is there something else going on? What's happening? So there? this is something I noted in the book that exactly what you said. I said that, you know, until probably February, March of 1918, the Bolshevik party was amazing. It, it was so democratic that in, I think, August or September of 2017, Zinoviev and Kamenev go to the press and they say, Lenin is plotting a coup. And they're not kicked out of the party. I would have kicked them out of the party. <laughs> but the democratic norms are so intense. Neil Harding did this study uh, in the 70s where he showed quantitatively that it's not just an assertion that they're the most democratic party. You can show it by virtue of the fact that the Bolsheviks had the most churning in the leadership through the bottom ranks and middle ranks of any party in Russia or even in Europe at the time, which meant that there was enormous mobility for younger cadre and activists who were shown to have energy. They moved right up, and they displaced the existing leadership. The question is how, and I threw up my hands, and I, I don't know. It, might, it could very well be that it was 40 individuals who came up the rank through the ranks and said, we will not tolerate the suppression of dissent. We're just going to be that. And after a while, it becomes a culture. I, I can't, I don't know of any organizational principle that I could point to that would generate this kind of democracy. I don't know. Because at the end of the day, here's the thing. It's a hierarchical organization, and if leaders want to, they can shut down whatever you want. Whatever measures you put into place, they'll shut it down. So there's a degree of acculturation and a commitment to certain principles, which again is why you, you have to filter who you're letting in. You, you can't just be click on this link and you know, you're a communist. So I, I think I, I can't get around, and this is something for us to research, I can't get around the, the, con, the, the sense that a lot of this is just contingent on the personalities who were there and their commitment to certain principles. All right, last question for me, which is, um, we talked about organizational, let's talk about institutional. Um, you argue that there is an institutional lesson from the Russian Revolution, and I guess broad, more broadly speaking, from other sort of state-directed socialist experiments. What would that be? Yeah, I call it institutional. You can call it whatever you want, I guess. It has to do with planning and the place of planning in socialism. And what I say is that maybe central planning is a realistic option for socialism, but there's no evidence that there is. And if we're going to be rational and scientific and not doctrinal about these things, if you were in 1905 or 1910 Germany or Russia, you can say, somebody says, hey, what's socialism? You can say, well, socialism, comrade, is a, is a uh, extinction of the market and turning to a planned rational economy. Because you hadn't experienced it yet and you hadn't seen all the problems with it. Today, by this time, you have to take on board the experience, not only of the Soviet Union, but also of China, also of Eastern Europe, also of Cuba. And th there is no instance where the ambition to centrally plan the economy worked out. It's of course possible, that maybe with these supercomputing facilities we might be able to, it's of course possible that because they were undemocratic and undemocratic planning can't work, only democracy will make yada, yada, yada. All that's, but the burden of proof is on the left. You cannot state it as a dogmatic principle, nor can you insist on it as a, for, as a kind of a first order commitment that you have, because there's been too many failures and one of the unfortunate legacies of Leninism is to turn theory into doctrine, which you cannot challenge. We have to be open to challenging this idea. So my view then is, let's have a slightly less ambitious set of commitments, which leaves open the possibility that perhaps we can move to a central planned economy, but more realistically says, our, our, we can, uh, the way I would put it is this, we fight for social democracy, we then, struggle for market socialism, and we hope for central planning. We know we can do social democracy. 
we're pretty sure we can do a market socialism. And I, I can lay out what I think are principles of that. But Catalyst two issues ago had a brilliant piece by Mike Beggs, which um, is the guts of a book that he's writing with Bhaskar Sankara and Ben Burgess, which I think is going to be an absolutely pivotal book uh, for the contemporary left. Where Mike is laying out what a detailed model of a kind of a workers controlled market socialism might look like. We need to have those debates now. And in Catalyst, I'm really trying to bring in people who will uh, engage in this debate of, of designing a blueprint of market socialism. We're pretty sure we, we can have a viable, at least plausible model of that. We know we can do a social democratic model. The idea is let's get, see if we can get to market socialism. And once we're there, push forward. Push forward in a way that's sustainable and doesn't suffer rollback. But the key take home lesson is this. Anyone who says socialism has to mean planned economies is just being dogmatic. You have to hold it open as a possibility, in my opinion. I don't think it's even a possibility. But I'm willing to be convinced. But the, what we have to understand is that the burden of proof is on us now. You can't say it with confidence that, that this is what socialism is going to be. So I'd like to open things up for questions. But before that, I wanted to thank Vivek and Anand. And I realized I didn't introduce myself because I took Vivek's advice too seriously to not talk about yourself at all if you're really a leftist. I'm Ariella Thornhill, and I'm a member of the Board of Jacobin. Very, very pleased to have um, been a part of this panel tonight. Thanks again to Vivek Chibber and Anand Gopal. And now we'd like to take some of your questions. You can raise a hand, and Chris is going to seek you out after I call on you. The person in the back with the bracelet? Hello. Hi. Um, Vivek, could yes, you sir. talk Hi. a little bit more about the importance of debate in organizations and the importance of that in terms of building ideological consistency or forming strategy uh, or building consensus? I feel like this is a trick question. <laughs> no. Because I, I would imagine the answer is obvious. Uh, that is really, imp really important. Uh, I, honestly, Chris, I, I don't know what, were you hoping I would give you a very specific answer? Because all I can say is deba without debate, of course, organizations die. But debates can't go on forever. Maybe that's what you mean. Yeah, at some point, man, debates have to end. Even if it's some people in the room are uncomfortable and feel like their position didn't win out. And the fact that you didn't win out doesn't make you a marginal oppressed minority. I guess to give to more context to that, okay. there's my experience in the left so far has been one of stifling debate and seeing it as something that is, uh, I don't know, um, violating one's personhood if you disagree or you know, seen as um, some sort of what yeah, do they look, call that, it nowadays? Yeah, as soon as, as soon as the left actually starts to move on things, this stuff's going to have to disappear. This happens when people have too much time on their hands. So they come in, you know, I, I, we're not done yet. I'm not satisfied yet. The, the debate has to go on. And people, are, when people say, like, look, man, I got three kids at home. Uh, I got to go to work tomorrow, and this is going nowhere. When that becomes the conversation, these things will come to an end. But as long as the left is attracting people who just have a lot of time on their hands and have no commitments, you're going to get this stuff. Yeah, I'll also to add that we, you know, we're a profoundly depoliticized society. Um, we're not used to debating in a serious way. And uh, I've noticed that um, there's an, uh, people have an allergic reaction sometimes to political debate. They think it's a personal attack, or they think that it's actually, when you disagree with somebody, you're somehow condemning them morally or something else. And in fact, to take somebody seriously, to respect them as a comrade, is to debate them to take their ideas seriously. We've unfortunately lost that idea in our depoliticization, and it's something that we should try to find a way to recover. You know, one of the things that is striking about the, not just the Bolshevik left, but social democratic parties as well, all through the 30s and 40s, one of the most striking things about their histories is nobody ever quit the party. They would lose every debate. They would hate what the leadership is doing, but they could not imagine a life where they quit the party. Because everything that they had in their lives, every bit of knowledge, every gain, and why? Because all of them were workers. It's shocking. 
to the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the social democratic parties, forget the, the communists, every elected official of social democratic parties was a blue collar worker. Every political leader came out of the working class. So the party was such a built in pillar of their lives, as Anand is saying, they never left it. Today, yeah, if, you, if you don't like a decision that your organization has made, you say, fuck it, I'm out of here. Exactly. It's a club. There's a difference between parties and social clubs. And this left still, because this left does not depend on the party for its material well-being, has come to the party largely as a moral calling or as a you know, kind of style point that, hey, man, I'm a, I'm a radical. Um, it can leave it like that. If, when you saw the collapse of the, what, what are these, all these post trotskyist organizations in England and the United States in the 2000 and teens, they happened overnight. People left them overnight because they were essentially like social clubs. They were students, they were academics, they were a few workers just for ornamentation. But nobody's material interest depended on it. When the left was an entity where everybody got their social, economic, et cetera, interest fulfilled through it, well, now Carissa's point, if a debate ends or if you lose the debate, you're like, fine. And then you carried out the directives of that party, even though you lost the debate, mm -hmm. because whatever else happens, the party is the entity that has to win. You don't sabotage the party from within because you lost the debate. That's because you depend on it. I think I, it's I also, sorry, I think no. it's an expression of this idea that is hard to root out, that institutions are the to sum total of the feelings of the people within those institutions. We need to be strategic, but I don't think we've been taught to think strategically. So the strategy for a long time has been hearts and minds, hearts and minds, hearts and minds. Change people's feelings. That's the, the root of anti-racism is just making people less mean when actually it's like making sure their babies don't die in the womb or making sure they have access to abortion or making sure they don't get kicked out of their houses. So I think it's hard like when you are in a interpersonal situation and the sort of folk theory of change is change your feelings, change your feelings, and then someone hurts your feelings and you're like, they are going to make a terrible world for me. It creates this sort of social panic and pressure which is actually irrelevant to the goal. The goal is the goal. The feelings don't matter. The strategic position of the working class in capitalism doesn't change because you have a disagreement or because somebody doesn't like what you said or because you lost the argument. But I think you know, that the, the teeth, the groundedness in reality comes from what you've just said, Vivek, that you know, you're, you're getting your paycheck because of the action that you're undertaking. You're making sure you have housing security because of the action that you're undertaking. It's very hard to be like, I'm gonna walk out on that. I would add to that too. Is that, I mean, if you think about activism, there's three components to activism. There's tactics, there's strategy, and there's the, the end goal that you want, right? Tactics, it's, it's possible to, to think tactically, even if you're an individual, it's possible to think about an end goal if you're an individual, if you read enough books. But strategy, that kind of middle, that middle layer, there, it's. I would argue it's almost impossible to think strategically unless you're part of an organization and an organization which is rooted in the working class, because strategy emerges out of sort of the struggles of being in the working class and 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 what you're up against. And so, part of the challenge that we have is because of a left that's divorced for various reasons from the working class, we're kind of adrift strategically, whereas we have tactics and we have end goals. Yeah, you, sir? criterion of profitability, mm -hmm. and they would still be in competition with other industries. 
these days is the plan of the economies that we have had have been a failure. Mm. Uh, but, but there are those economies that have been command economies, mm. which have handed down orders from the top, mm. uh, which have relied on pure or mainly quantitative <coughs> measurements of mm. production, mm. and uh, which, uh, which therefore uh, workers felt they had no part in, and that they tended to work around the quotas rather than try mm. uh, to meet them. Mm. Uh, but, uh, has it occurred to you uh, that some form, some strong form of centralized planning uh, would be workable if uh, the workers, if, if, uh, if it wasn't simply a command economy, uh, but the workers had a very strong power in implementing, central, in drawing up central plans mm -hmm. that were uh, being worked, uh, that uh, were being put into practice, and implementing them uh, such as ways of devising how to carry them out, they could elect their own Europe, yeah. and I, so yeah. so why do you dismiss that possibility? Um, I haven't dismissed it. What I've said is that it's certainly possible, but the burden of proof is on its proponents to show that it can work. Well, now, that's, that's why the burden of proof is, <laughs> yeah. uh, because well, it Jesus hasn't come down yet either from the skies. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we can assert that it's going to happen. Um, I, I, you're, I, I think these are all real possibilities, what you're saying. I, I think the dilemma is this, that I, it's very hard to envision any planned economy in which there isn't a very strong command structure. Because even when, if you draw in the workers' energies and you get from them their uh, consumption plans and their consumption intentions and what kind of work rhythm they would like to see, what kind of wage structure they'd like to see, even after you get all that, the plan, if it's a plan, has to extend over a period of time, three years, five years, after which you will come up with a second plan. After the workers put in their initial assessments of their consumption needs and their work priorities, the plan is based on that. That means for the next three to four years, they are committed to what they said in the initial three to four years. It's very, very difficult to imagine that their needs and their assessments and their priorities won't change after that. And that is the problem the Soviet Union faced. It's a myth that in Yugoslavia, in the Soviet Union, in China, workers had no say. They actually had, they tried to implement some degree of workers' control and workers' input. The difficulty was that, two difficulties, I don't want to get into the weeds. One was that they changed their assessments of what their needs were within a few months of when they had said. Now, if the plan is sensitive to the workers' new judgments about their consumption priorities, now the plan has to be rejigged. And once it's rejigged in one out setting, it has to, because it's an integrated plan, all the estimates for all the other regions and all the other industrial sectors also have to be changed. The problem in the Soviet Union was this. They drew up five-year plans. Each, but say you have, have a five-year plan for 1936, it was not finalized till 1942. It, it became completely null and void. And so what you actually had was rolling one-year plans. Rolling one-year plans are not plans. It was a command economy that had no command. And, that's, and so what's the response on the part of the workers? They don't believe or buy any of the plan dictates that are coming down to them. And now if the workers don't accept their share of what has to be produced, and instead what they do is they hedge their bets by distorting the signals they're giving out to the planners because they know the planners won't be able to implement the plan they're given anyway. What you had was two sides trying to outguess each other. That is, I do not know any way around that, not even with computers. So yes, it has occurred to me. I have not <coughs> seen a viable solution, and it's occurred to every single critic of Soviet planning. These model of democratic planning always proceed as if they're the first ones to think of it. Soviets also thought of it. The Yugoslavs and the Hungarians also thought of it. The problem was they could not marry those worker-led initiatives to a overall planned structure of the economy. I, I don't know any way we could. I haven't seen a model that shows that you could. Oh, OK, hi. I have, I have yeah, a question. Hi. I have a party question. Um, so it seems like it's it makes sense that we can have like a labor party in places that have like proportional representation. So they have to like form coalitions and get things done. But in the US, what does that look like? Like do we try to create a labor movement through an existing party? Do we try to take one over? Like how I don't know if that's like ever been really I don't know if it's been discussed, maybe it has. Um uh, Caroline, I think the I think one has to be completely open. I, I think one not, one cannot take a firm position on this. 
Um, well, one thing we can say is it's, you're not going to get a viable third party in the American electoral system that's an electoral party. The, the, the rules are just rigged. I, I read somewhere once that since the Civil War, there have been, and this might be apocryphal, but if the, if the number is anywhere in the vicinity of this number, it's sobering. But since the Civil War, there have been 1,000 attempts at a third party. OK, so odds are it doesn't work. That said, parties don't have to be viable electoral alternatives to Democratic Party. You can have a party. The communists were a party. And they managed to exert enormous pressure on the political economy and on the Democratic Party without having any real electoral success and initially even electoral ambitions for themselves. You know, up until the end part of the Popular Front era, the communists weren't really electorally that interested. I believe you do need a party of some kind. I don't think you should think of it as a alternative to the Democrats electorally, because I don't see that working. But there, there are many um, alternatives between those extremes. It can be a party that is like what the DSA is trying to do right now, work in tandem with the Democratic Party. It can be a party that abjures elections but sees its goal as simply organizing the working class. We have to be open to, we have to see what works because it's a very different capitalism from the capitalism of 1934. Chris, do we have time for one more question? No, we have time for, we've got 845, right? More, yeah. Yeah, couple oh, more. great. We uh, have time for more than one there. more question. I'm just going to let Chris go to you. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name's Summer. It's good to meet you. Hi. Um, I have a question for the panel. Um, as much as I love discussing, you know, leftism in America, I would love to hear you guys comment on the state of the right in America. You know, just to kind of mix up the conversation, any comments you'd like to make on that, um, whether it's, you know, grassroots movements, astroturf movements, political media, anything you'd like to speak about, comment on the state of the right. You guys go ahead first. <laughs> Why do you both look at me? <laughs> Ariella, you found we, my Twitter. We know you're deep in yeah. The world, so. <laughs> um, well, what I would say is I think uh, they're better organized. I think that they understand the system, they understand the rules of the game, and we see a lot of this culture war nonsense, which has real dangerous implications for people. The restrictions that they're putting on people do have real dangerous implications. It's not to dismiss those issues, but we need to size them up appropriately. I think the left can be navel-gazing. Um, the right tends to be more even-headed in its strategy, even even when we've seen these kind of um, wild outbursts like January 6th, there is still a mechanism that folds it into some kind of coherent narrative for the working class. It says, the reason you're oppressed is X, we are doing Y, and it's usually not gonna do anything, but they do say it. You know, on our side, we have like Bernie, He's out there. He's been saying the same thing for 40 years. <laughs> and you have to respect that. But we don't have the same grip on the narrative. And we also, I think, need to be clear headed about the ways that the right has won. It's not just that they're winning the, you know, the culture war side. It's that they also are able to enact small concessions to the working class that make them feel as though something is happening. The, the tariffs against China probably were horrible for most farmers in the US, m most in industry in the US, but people thought it was doing something. And it was a real economic program, similar to Trump taking away the Obamacare penalty, where if you didn't have health insurance, then you paid a tax penalty. That made people have a couple hundred extra dollars. That's a real thing that they got from it. I don't think the left has been clear enough about how we combat that. I don't think that we engage seriously with the issues of those groups. I had a friend who was an organizer in casinos and she'd go upstate a lot because there's a lot of casinos up there. And she said that on the shop floor, the st two stewards were Trumpies. They were like, we love Trump. And the DSA came to help them pick it, and they were like, cool. You know, <laughs> we have to start thinking about organizing around 
those human issues and take away the sort of fervor, the, the, the storytelling, the metaphors, look at what's happening in people's real lives because we are small, we are not as well funded, and we have to constantly say that we're working for everybody. In order to do that, we have to stop ignoring some of them and show our real difference between you know, the both parties that say that they're actually doing something for the working class. Yeah, I think that's right. I would add to that too, um, that we, it's hard sometimes to, to see this because this is the, the air we, we breathe, but uh, the US today is just profoundly deinstitutionalized, depoliticized society. And that affects the left in some interesting ways. It kind of affects the right too. If you if you read the thirty about the thirties, for example, in Germany, uh, and you look at the ways in which people on the right were socialized into um, right wing politics, there were so many social clubs and there was political parties, etc. It wasn't just on the left, um, and w all of that's gone by the wayside as well. So I, in so in in a kind of interesting way, the right also faces some of the challenges that the left faces. The difference is the right has a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right, so they're able to overcome that just by blasting people with propaganda through through talk radio or by um, reaching people in other ways. But organizationally, I mean, like I, I don't think there's actually a very powerful on the ground right wing movement in the way that it w would have been in the 1930s, 1940s. And so, the challenges are kind of interesting in that we we both sides are facing these these challenges. Um, yeah, one way in which the right in the United States is different from that of Europe is that because of the winner-take-all electoral system, unlike Europe, the right here has not been able to find a political party of its own. The, so they've been forced into the Republican Party. And now what you're seeing is this kind of civil war inside the Republican Party. Now, this right, the Trumpian element of that right, and Trump is the, the kind of the lightning rod for this right-wing resurgence inside the Republican Party, it, it has a very strong populist element to it, as Ariella was saying, which gets its traction from the fact that a lot of working class people see its hatred of and disdain for what they think is the establishment, right? Which it has two components to it, the Democratic Party and liberals, by which they mean, you know, people in the colleges, the universities and such things. That, interestingly, that right has money, but the, the major sections of American capital uh, don't want it because the mainstream Republican Party does perfectly fine for them. They're, they're happy to use the, the, the farther right, like previously it was the Tea Party, now it's Trump, as a kind of a pummeling device against the welfare state. But they also know that they're nuts mm -hmm. and they're not people to be trusted with accumulation and the environment for accumulation. Problem is, thanks to the internet and small funders, they've lost control. So what you're seeing happening is big money trying to rein in the Trump forces and the Trump forces being able to sustain themselves through this money machine that they have. So one element of this far right is this populist element which appeals to people of less means who give them the, their small donations which allow them to essentially take up the battle inside the Republican Party against big capital. The second element is the liberals, and let me just say this. Um, the left is going to lose the culture wars. And that's because much of what the right says about the culture wars is correct. Liberals hate working people. This, this obsession with language and trivia and culture and all this is ignoring the real issues of the day. And you know, the response of people like AOC is just horrible. Like just yesterday she says, the accusations of wokeness ignore the fact that there's much more important things going on. Yeah, but that is wokeness. Wokeness, the critique of wokeness appeals to ordinary Americans because they think wokeness ignores the real trials and tribulations of their lives. To dismiss, so for example, if you're obsessed with language wars and culture wars, if you're obsessed with wrong kinds of speech and you make that the issue of the day, people are gonna turn away from you. At the same time, the right has been able to mobilize the fact that on campuses, it's the liberals who are shutting down speech. For the left to ignore this and say, I saw Brianna Joy Gray say, well, yeah, but this is nothing compared to what Ron DeSantis is doing. What does that have to do with anything? 
if you if if you st if you have principles, and the principle is that we see education and universities as a place where sp speech should in fact flourish, then you back that. And you don't say, hey, well, it's the wrong kind of speech. I mean, for the ACLU to say this blows my mind. They should take the CL out of ACLU. And, the, and you don't say, well, you do it more than us. What does that even mean? Until, the le until there's a left that's committed to actual principles, we will lose these, these culture wars. And you lose the culture wars with working people. That's why there's a defection. It's not an ocean yet. There's an absolute uh, unavoidable defection of working people, primarily white, but also brown and black, out of the Democratic Party. And do not kid yourselves. It has to do with disgust at what educated liberals are forcing down their throats in terms of the culture that they're, that's around them. So to my mind, if you want to outflank the right, of course, the first issue is attending to the everyday practical needs of working people, which includes white people. And secondly, showing that you actually stand for something. Have, you have some principles. One more, maybe? Yeah, we can do one more question. Try to make it quick. Um, one of my favorite things kind of about your book and about your ideas is this idea of accessibility. And I think kind of going off what you had just previously said, um, you know, kind of shutting down the esoteric talk and, and things like that and making this something that people can digest. How do we bring this idea, something like your book, into the working class without, you know, with one, the stream of information being kind of controlled by capitalism right now and without seeming like we're just going to cause a reaction like because I think capitalism is sort of a dirty word um, in a lot of you know work or anti-capitalism is sort of a dirty topic to bring up um, and for me yeah, I'm just curious I think as an individual kind of working within the working class how do I bring up these conversations in a way that you know gets well taken. one thing we have going for us um, it's hard to bring up these issues and conversations to a bunch of grad students because A, they don't give a shit, and B, you're directly going against their material interests. They don't want to hear about this stuff. The thing about working people is yeah, they experience it every day, and that's why the, the, the guts of the theory have been successful for 150 years because you don't have to use big pollute, high pollutant ideas to convey them to people. All you got to do is say, hey, doesn't this shit happen to you every day? Isn't this guy doing the same thing every day? Is, don't you think there's a connection between how you're treated at work and the shitty life you have at home? This kind of, and they'll say, yeah, but Trump is going to solve all that for me. Right? So I think what the, book is, what the book is meant for is to help, as it were, the cadre, the organizers, organize their thoughts so that when they have conversations with working people, they can help working people make the connections. And here's the key, connections between things they already know. If you're talking to people to whom you have to explain what a labor process is, you're talking to the wrong person. And that's grad student. That's much of the left today, right? So I think in terms of how you convey this to working people, it's not hard because you're just pointing things out that they already know. What's harder is to get them to accept your strategic vision because they don't see it as realistic. They're like, well, you're going to take those guys on? I mean, they've got all the tanks. They've got all the guns. That's where you have to build up their confidence, their trust. And you do that not by being the most radical person in the room who wants to storm the Bastille, but by taking up winnable struggles first. S start small. You take up achievable goals within the workplace. And then they see, oh, I we can actually do something. And then you build on that and you build on that. It's a slow process, but there's, a, there's always a tipping point after which they really gain confidence and trust in each other. The, the initial part of getting there to talk to them, the hardest part is physically being present. If you're physically present, our experience is that it doesn't take much long, very long to get them to see the virtue of what you're saying. It's hard to get them to accept the strategic vision that you have because they correctly understand that you got no power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it goes back to what you were saying, Anand, about living in a depoliticized society, too. It's... Yeah. It's not that this is totally alien to people. Most people that you'll meet will be exploited. It's just that uh, we, we're facing a demoralization in the Well, in it's the same also, term. look, it's just, 
you know how many union campaigns actually end up in, with mm -hmm. a victory? Let me, if, you're, if employers wage an anti-union campaign to your start trying to organize a union, in those settings, the success rate is somewhere between 10 and 20%. You wanna know why the UAW is organizing grad students? It's not just the grad students. Most of the American labor movement only organizes in places where employers don't wage anti-union campaigns. Because when they do wage anti-union campaigns, overwhelmingly they lose. Now, take that fact, and now imagine you're going to a worker and saying, yeah, man, let's go on a strike. The first thing they're going to do is to say, dude, you're going to lose me my job. It's a rational response, right? So getting them to admit to their structural situation is not hard getting them to agree to a collective solution to it where they bear all the risks, that's where the tough job comes in. And there's no magic pill. You're just gonna have to do that work. You're gonna have to figure out ways of organizing them. And it's, it's, the first precondition is instilling trust and confidence, what, what we call solidarity. That's a long process. Reminds me of a story that my aunt told me. She works, she still works at Philip Morris in Virginia and they're unionized. And they closed a plant that wasn't union. They brought all the workers up to the, the Richmond, Virginia plant. And it just so happens that the Richmond plant is mostly black workers. The other plant was mostly white workers. And the white workers came in and they were like, we almost lost our jobs. We got a new job here. And they were working so fast. And my aunt was like, we all just looked at them and we were like, mm -mm, no. And <laughs> the workers in the, you know, the original Virginia plant took them aside and they were like, you have to stop. And the white workers who were shipped in were like, we can't, we're gonna lose our jobs. They hadn't had a union and um, my aunt goes, you're in the union now. The union sets the pace. The next day when you come in, they're gonna say like, you did 40 cartons, so now you do 45. And the day after that, they're gonna say, you did 45, so now you do 50. She's like, we, we decide how many we do. We know how much we can do. We're the ones doing it. We decide what's safe. And they were scared, but they saw, like, it, it, at first, what they saw, I think, is a kind of attack. Like, they're trying to get us all fired. They don't want us here. Turned into, like, an act of solidarity. And it's pretty simple. It's super easy to understand why you wouldn't want to keep working at a faster and faster and faster pace and why your boss would have an interest in you doing that. And I think from that moment on, they had a real actual bond with the other new people. They decided like, we're not gonna go in competitive. We're not gonna undermine you. You're part of this now. We're, we're all here together. And yeah, you probably will fail. <laughs> Definitely more often than not, but that's all we have. All right, I got the sign from Chris. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank again Vivek Chibber, the author of Confronting Capitalism, and Anand Gopal. Thank you so much, both of you, for being thank here. Thank you, Ariella, and Anand, from my side. And thank you, audience, for your questions. They were wonderful.